would be honored if you would join us. Hey guys, so uh, yeah, we're live and and uh, on the we're on Twitch, Facebook, and, and YouTube this week, so it's super exciting. And we've got a special guest with a, with us this week is uh, Finn McManus. So I'm um, hey Finn, and uh, yeah, hey. welcome to the stream. So, Thanks so much. I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I think it's it's good to catch up. I think the last time that maybe we spoke was at, at Lightbox last. Oh year, yeah, probably, yeah, like, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, now. yeah. really, really yeah, briefly, yeah. right? But um. Oh yeah, super briefly. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm bummed that it's not on this year because I me too, <laughs> was all ready to go. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um yeah, obviously welcome to the stream. Maybe um Thanks. maybe do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and and what you yeah, do sure. and where you work um, and stuff? I'm a, a concept artist in the entertainment industry. I've been working uh, in film and games for about seven years. Uh, I studied both at Art Center and uh, Brainstorm School in Burbank and um, worked for a variety of companies, uh, you know, between Sony for games and EA and then uh, 20th Century Fox, Disney for, for film stuff. And, um, you know, I, I also developed my own projects on, this, on my spare time, which is what I'll be uh, taking a shot at today. And cool. uh, just generally, you know, like painting, like designing, yeah. and happy to be here. Awesome. That's pretty cool. So, yeah, I know you've worked on some pretty awesome projects. So, yeah, I'm super keen to, to check out what you're doing and, you know, some little tips and techniques and all oh, that totally. kind of stuff along the way. Yeah, I can go through that for days. <laughs> yeah, we've got, um, we've got uh, obviously, you know, um, if you guys have any questions, please let us know. We don't, we don't really have like a set set layout of what we're going to do today. So yeah, if you guys have questions, let us know, and that can that can really uh, you know push the direction of the chat. So yeah, today's a little bit different. I think last week we kind of have a had a two hour session, but this week we've got a one hour session. So um yeah, get your questions in quick because time's going to fly. I think. And, yeah, uh, sorry about that, yeah. guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. It's great. You can. Um, it's great that we can set it up and. Yeah, we we're just kind of talking about how sort of crazy it is with all the resources that students and people starting out have got access to these days. Um, yeah, just just even doing these types of streams, I know there's there's a lot of them up at the moment. Like yeah, you know, brainstorm and Pixelogic and all these places are all kind of doing streams with artists. And it's just so cool, right? Like absolutely, what what, uh, what kind of students can can kind of uh, get their hands yeah, on. Yeah, I, so. I wish when uh, I was starting, there was all these resources. I mean, I got fairly lucky as well. At least there was, you know, Brainstorm when I started out that helped me so much. Yep. Um, but, you know, these days, she's with Gumroad's, Patreon's, everything. It's, it's very, very cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of, one of uh, uh, there's a question, statement. Um, huh. give, give VR workflow, please. <laughs> Give VR workflow. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm afraid I'm not I can't. Sure that's going to happen in an hour. On yeah, on I'm Zoom afraid chat. I can't go into VR today. <laughs> um, but you know, I I did do most of this scene right now in VR um, earlier, and uh, there's a bunch of demos I did on VR stuff online. Um, I highly recommend the program uh, Oculus Medium. That's the main one I use, or now it's Adobe mm -hmm. Medium. Uh, yeah. And they're they're developing some great great new tools for it. So if you get on it now, uh, you're gonna get access soon to some really amazing updates for the program. Um, and mainly what I do is I'll do everything from environment sculpts to characters, vehicles in there. Um, and I treat it very similar to painting. You know, I do uh, a line sketch basically of what I want to create previously, and then. I work with either stamps and tools that I've made to, to design them and finish them, or um, I just block them out and then finish them in, in Cinema 4D, which is what I'm, I'm rendering with now. That's cool. So was um so obviously like there's the whole Blender bandwagon going on at the moment. So are you a yeah. bit more just you sticking with Cinema 4D? Like that's just what you're kind of yeah, working I mean, with. And the you thing just, is, is like it? Cinema is something where there's there's nothing I need to change in my workflow. There's everything that I want to do besides the VR stuff I can do inside the program. Um, so I've gotten very, very used to it over the years. So to, you know, switch to Blender after seven plus years in cinema, um, 
I'm, I know Blender's an amazing program. And if I were to start over again, like right now, I probably would learn Blender for sure. Yep. Yep. Uh, but just because I, I am very fast and efficient in cinema, that's what I personally prefer to work with. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's got lighting, uh, octane, a lot of really cool simulation stuff. Um, it's, it's very quick to work with. And uh, it works very well, and specifically in the entertainment industry, a lot of companies uh, use it as well. So it, it allows you to go back and forth between things pretty easily. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's cool. And like, it's a similar thing for guys that are using Maya and stuff, right? Where they're like, oh, I yeah. just use Maya because I know how to how to use it. So I don't think there's any, there's certainly no right or wrong programs and stuff. It's yeah. just, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's cool to, yeah, cool to see this. So. Um, yeah, we've got a question. Uh, where do you get most of your inspiration for ideas from? Also, any tips for building a strong visual library and design sense? Ooh, I could talk for a while about this. <laughs> so uh, personally for me, my inspiration ends up coming from all over the place. Uh, you know, I, I would say the biggest inspiration I have comes from traveling. And a lot of the time when I'm doing personal work or really anything, um, I try to capture, you know, the wonder and excitement of, of seeing a new place for the first time, like an ancient ruin or a huge temple, like that, capturing that moment and that excitement. So that's a lot of my inspiration comes from moments I've experienced in real life that I want to replicate in another medium, or if I want to show someone what I experienced through design. Um, I would say, you know, as, as a designer, Anything you paint or draw is based upon your memories, you know, things that you've read, seen, heard, experiences. So the more experiences you can have, think of that as contributing to your visual library. You know, the more books you read, the more you know, documentaries you listen to, the more different worldviews you see, learning more about religion, more about construction. I think uh, Construct is one of those shops where you essentially have to learn a bit of everything. Um, you know, I've, I've studied some engineering, some mechanics, a lot about architecture. I've learned a ton about different cultures, different histories, and all of that really, really helps me do my job. So um, in general, I find for my own personal work, most of my inspiration comes from nature and architecture, specifically old and ancient architecture. So ancient cultures um, and in nature it can be everything from like landscapes to trees to underwater stuff. Um, that's where most of my inspiration comes from. Uh, in terms of visual library, you know, that's something that you really work on for your whole life. Um, the, the best thing I would say for visual library is to make sure that you're not always doing the same thing. Uh, you know, you want to be, you want to try to approach life by trying to capture as many different things as possible, because the more different things you try out, um, in the end, that's going to give more to your visual library than anything else. Um, so it just kind of goes along with what I said about, you know, traveling, finding inspiration, in other cultures and other, other things that you're passionate about. Um, personally for my visual library, when I started it, when I was just starting out, I drew and, and painted a lot. I didn't do much 3d when I was in school. Um, and that did help me a lot because, uh, you know, when you, when you really understand something by painting and drawing it, it becomes kind of ingrained in your memory. Um, so those are kind of my, uh, that, that's kind of my advice in terms of visual library stuff. Hopefully that, that kind of answers yeah, the question. Yeah, I think that's one thing because obviously um, if there's anyone joining the stream that doesn't know, we're, we're a um, school of visual effects and entertainment design here in Australia. And obviously, yeah, talking to Finn in, in the States. And, and so we, we're dealing with students a lot. So that's kind of like a bit of the context of the conversation. And I think that sometimes that is a very tricky thing for students and artists starting out now is there's so many 3D tools that are mixing with 2D that it's like, what do I learn first? I don't know the process of how to, of how to do this. And I think it's really difficult. So are you, are you still of the mindset of like, you know, try and get the drawing mileage first and then build into the 3D? 100%. And, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I have a bit of an interesting perspective because before I went to art school, I was a 3D artist. Uh, when right, I was in right. high school, yeah. Um, all I did was 3D. So I didn't have any experience drawing or painting when I applied to Art Center and I saw that they required, you know, paintings, drawings, sketches. I was like, oh man, that's going to take a while to learn this stuff. And I can say without a doubt that learning how to draw, paint, perspective, it helped me so, so much with my design skills. That's 100% uh, a necessity 
in my opinion, for, for learning design the right way is learning your fundamental skills. And that's as well, just with visual library, that's something that doesn't change as you go throughout life. Uh, you want to also keep improving that, you know, I still practice drawing and painting all the time, even though I don't really post stuff like that. It's not in my portfolio as much. Um, it's something that really, really matters. And I'd recommend to anybody, you know, in the industry. Yeah, no, that, that's cool. And we've got, um, we've got kind of an interesting question, which I think is really good. Um, uh, someone is talking in the chat that they're, they've been self-taught self and mm -hmm. trying to solve design problems. And they're saying they would obviously go for the design that looks cool, but doesn't necessarily, necessarily solve the problem. How does one select a design that solves the problem and looks cool? <laughs> oh, huh. Uh, I would say start with solving the problem first and then try to make it look interesting afterwards. Uh, because like, say you have a, a brief from a client and, um, you know, they, they ask you to design uh, a vehicle that has a certain function. I want to completely understand that function and how it works, uh, before I make like a beautiful landscape to go along with it or before I make like the armor or something on the vehicle. Um, you want to first completely understand the, the mechanism and nature of the problem that you're facing. And then you approach it afterwards with how do I make it look interesting? Just like I, how I did this scene here is um, the idea behind it. This is referring to the question is that there was a war that took place in this village, in this town that I'm doing the call out for a long time ago that destroyed a lot of the architecture. And um, the civilization came back and rebuilt it by growing different types of architecture out of the old architecture. So you can see that, you know, this huge kind of shell-like thing is protruding out of the old ruins and it became, becomes a new home. Now, I, I modeled that and made sure that the idea of it worked before I started putting texture, color, lighting, all that stuff on it. If I had started with my lighting and color and and putting blockouts in without thinking about solving the, the history, the story of what I'm trying to make, that would be basically what we're talking about. It'd be like trying to make something cool before you're actually designing. And, and design is always the most important part. I mean, you can have, a, I, I feel like something that is designed well will always look cool. You know, if you're solving the problem, usually it will already look really interesting and cool because, you know, humans are drawn to that natural complexity of, of things that work and function. You know, your brain has a subconscious way to interpret things that work and it informs you, oh, this is something that actually has substance to it. So we respond to that substance. And I think just by solving the problem first, you're already going to create something that looks interesting. Things you add on top of that, you know, will have help to emphasize the interest in it. Yeah, no, sure. That's, that's great. Great information. <laughs> um, so this is this for your um is it project blue is that uh, it's uh so this is for uh blue valley and it's part of uh, a much larger project that i'll i'll be able to post in about a month or so and i decided to do like a, a call out you know for a house just to explore the design of this one individual structure and that's something that you know someone's looking to build a portfolio out there this is something that really helps, you know, with a, a game design portfolio or even film as well, where you really explore the design of one piece of architecture or one object. Um, you know, I, I decided to go a bit further and add a scene around it. That's not usually necessary. Um, but this is something that, you know, it allows you to focus on the design of one thing without having a lot of distractions. Like the other idea for this would be this, this building in a big cityscape. Now, if you have that, then you have all these competing design elements and you're not able to focus and analyze this one structure. So that's why you separate it out and start working at it um, as its own individual design. So that's that's kind of what I'm doing here. You know, the idea for this is that this building is, is growing and I'm going to be adding more things to indicate that. And it's disturbing, you know, the ground around it. It's starting to rise up out of the ground and take over this this piece of architecture that was destroyed and left behind beforehand um so that's the kind of idea behind this one you know the the textures all this stuff um these are things that i painted and then i put them in 3d and use them as a texture and i feel like when you do that to a 3d image that really gives it a lot more life you know i try to paint my textures whenever i can because i found that um if you do that uh it starts to feel 
starts to feel a lot more like it has a soul to it rather than the the very you know soulless 3d that you usually have that's cool yeah <clears throat> we got some more questions here as well uh oh. what t what type of exercises do you recommend for someone who who is a beginner at digital painting and how to deal with color and light in a realistic way in in environments i have a hard so, time doing basically anything that isn't a copy of a photo okay so um i mean you already that's already the first thing i would suggest is you want to start out like let's, if we're talking very beginner level with painting you want to start out with black and white studies and i would say the thing that helped me most when i was really just starting out trying to get a hold of things like uh, value read and you know, composition was taking a, a marker set, just uh, one black Sharpie and doing tons of studies of, uh, of different life situations. So I go out and study nature, architecture, uh, people. And the idea is that you only have black and white values to work with. And it's about selling, you know, that idea with just black and white. And that is a really, really valuable and helpful exercise. Um, you know, definitely do the photo studies, uh, material studies, like material spheres. That was very helpful for me. Um, but in the end, I, I believe, you know, John, my friend John told me this, that the foundation for all painting relies in drawing ability. And I, I think that's definitely true. Um, I noticed as I got better with drawing, my painting drastically improved. So I'd highly recommend, you know, anybody who's struggling with painting, uh, work on your drawing skills and then work on your studies. You know, I, when you get, when you get a bit farther and you, you want to start developing your own style, I recommend doing a bunch of master studies, um, but not of the same artists of a bunch of different artists. So you kind of get a range of, uh, you know, what styles are out there. And that's another thing that really helped me a lot was doing a lot of studies from, from different artists and, and trying to analyze their brush efficiency, their brush work, their approach to, to color and light. I think those were what helped me a lot, uh, especially the marker practice. I think that's the, the most helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. And I think one thing with the doing the studies is like, when you kind of do them guys, try to like have a goal in mind of what you're doing when you're studying something rather than just like copying it kind of one-to-one -one, because sometimes you don't really actually pick out that, that much. Like yeah. try to be like, I want to do a study to learn about like brush economy or learn the way that they're, you know, um, kind of carving out forms with different edges or, you know, um, the flow to the strokes and things like, I don't know. Do, do you sort of agree with that? Totally. Or, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely agree because, um, you know, if you're, if you're doing a study and you're trying to focus on everything, your, your brain's going to get lost. And it's kind of like being a jack of all trades. It's like you, you're going to just be okay at doing this study, five different things. You're, you're going to have okay value or okay lighting. Uh, in the end, what you really want to do is like you said, like focus on one thing to take away. And uh, what I found the best, and I have some examples of this, like really old ones on my art station, was after doing a, a study or a master copy, I would immediately do, you know, a quick environment sketch trying to utilize the same things I learned. So if it's color that I studied, I would do one using the color or the composition or the value structure. And that really cements it in your head, you know, what the artist was thinking or, you know, how the photograph works. I think those are what really, really helped me a lot in the end. No, that's really cool. And so with this one now, you just, um, I can notice he's just fiddling around the background, kind of messing yeah. around with the values and stuff. You're just trying to get yeah. it to sit nice and get the get the f f that main element popping yeah so if i show you like where it started um you know a lot of things i've done is is simplify everything so if we look at the value structure uh right now if you if you squint your eyes it's very clear where you want to look because there's a lot of high contrast high detail areas here mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at you know the beginning especially the sky um there's way too much detail everywhere there's a lot of noise and what I want to do is simplify all of that so that the area that I want people to look at and that has all this detail, it's easier for your eye to break down and understand. It's easier for you to, to think about, you know, what's going on in there. Um, in terms of the color, you know, I did a lot of changes with the color too, even though it's kind of subtle, is that in the 3D render, there's all these textures, colors that I made. And, you know, one of the first things I did was do a color adjustment to bring out all the subtle colors there and what i basically do for that is i use uh selective color 
And I kind of just go with my gut. I go through each of these from red to magenta. And I just, I play with these sliders until I see that I like what I see, you know, if there's a color that's popping up more than it did before. Mm -hmm. um, I really play with those until I, I understand, you know, what's looking nice in there. That's cool. Yeah. L looking good so far. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, hey, we got some questions. I got to scroll. <laughs> um, uh, what kind of principles do you consider when, when you're designing sci fi hard surface paneling and how far future? and far future technology specifically so obviously yes so uh, i've had to do a lot of sci-fi stuff recently and um the main thing with paneling is you want to think about uh well there's a lot of things you know why is it protecting something uh what is it protecting it from and those are like the two main questions for me you know if, if you're protecting uh like a structure from some sort of weathering damage versus protecting it from like a bomb or something like that the paneling is going to be very different and it's going to have different purposes so i think uh every concept has a start in, in research so you want to make sure that you research you know what are the types of armor plates that we use today in society what are they for how effective are they then look at how they're put together and then try to mimic something like that, but, but advance it in your head. Like, okay, what are technologies that these people would use in the future to do this sort of thing? Um, that's kind of where I would start with it. And uh, then I would think about, okay, you know, it's the future, maybe they have modular paneling. So maybe, maybe the pan paneling can be connected in this very modular way. Maybe the paneling is, is automated. It has some sort of rotational automated function so that it can sense where the attacks are coming from and immediately change to get the best angle for the attack to deflect off of. Things like that, you know, thinking about high concept ideas for uh, how that sort of stuff could be used, I think it kind of separates designs out rather than just being like a regular, you know, paneling that everybody has. Yeah, that's cool. And is it? Do you have any sort of like go-to references that you use for for some of that stuff, or do you think after a while it's just like visual library? You know, it is. It can be visual library, but definitely, you know, like I I had to do some paneling recently on a project. And I I always do some research. I don't just like head into it gung ho and just just start doodling, um, because there's you know there's always new information that's out there that you're gonna find. Um, and for me, you know. I, I would say just just start with research. Look at you know modern airplanes, tanks, uh, structures, different materials that we have now that are new, and you know maybe there's stuff that uh, is a, just appearing in terms of technology, and and see how you know you can use that to your benefit. That's what I would kind of say. I don't have. I wouldn't say I have like one resource for that. Mm -hmm. I generally do a lot of different searches online, uh, and then try to compile you know, the different notes together. No, that's cool. That's cool. Um, oh, now I'm losing track of questions. Sorry. No worries. No worries. Uh, P Peter Young says hello. Oh, Peter, we were just speaking about you, bro. Oh, man, how are you doing? I miss you, dude. It's been so long. Oh, miss Peter. Um, question is, which brainstorm classes did you take back back when you studied there any Ooh, great memories <laughs> oh man so many great memories uh those are some of the best times i ever had um you know i, I really miss being a student a lot of the time i mean i'm definitely glad i, I i'm working you know and, and doing images and jobs that i really enjoy but there's something so great and you don't really realize that you don't you kind of take it for granted when you're a student that you can devote the entire day just to learning what you want and that was very special for me when i was a brainstorm um, I would say uh, my favorite classes that I took there, um, a lot of them, you know, a lot of them have to do with the teacher for sure, but a lot of them also has to have to do with the students that you have in your class. Uh, you know, the class that I took where we actually came up with Blue Valley, this IP, was, um, oh man, I think it was, um, let me look it up. It's on their website. It was, it was great though, because all the students there were, a lot of them were professionals already and uh, they're just incredible artists and they all really pushed it every week. I took Entertainment Design 2, that was it, or maybe it was Entertainment Design 3. Um, and everybody stayed in the class, you know, no one dropped out. And every week, you know, people would bring stuff to class that was just so inspiring. 
And that was, you know, one of my favorite moments in school because you knew every week when you came to class that you would leave there being incredibly inspired and be ready, you know, it doesn't matter what time it was at night, but you just want to create something and be like, oh man, I, this gave me so many ideas and I need to, need to do good work. Um, so that's something that really stood out for me. Uh, I also took architecture design there, which was great. I took a vehicle design class there, which was also really nice. Um, I took Nick Jindro's environment design too. That was really, really, really helpful. You know, I, I ended up working with Nick and he's one of the most amazing people and one of the best designers I know. And I was, I'm very, very grateful to have him as my teacher because uh, he helped me really understand values and composition in a way that I didn't realize before I had him as an instructor. Uh, I took a lot of classes from James Peck, who's an amazing instructor. And, you know, I have to recommend John Park because he's, you know, my mentor and the guy who's helped me so much with all aspects of life. Um, so I, I have to recommend all those guys. They're fantastic instructors there. Yeah, that's awesome. John's okay at art, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what else have we got here? Um, Thanks so much for your advice. Uh, the problem I'm having at the moment with color and brush choice, do you think less brushes at the start is better? Question mark. Um, I guess it depends how you're approaching it, right? Because if you're doing, I mean, everybody's going to work differently. I, it's hard for me to give my opinion on this one because I'm kind of of the frame of mind that you can always simplify things afterwards. You know, I simplify stuff at the end of the process when I've conveyed all the information I want to, then I go back and remove. I don't uh, remove information as I'm creating something. So for me, um, the brush strokes and detail level at the beginning, like for right now, you know, this is 3D, I'm gonna be simplifying all of this at some stage in the process. Um, but none of that really matters for me until the end. You know, it doesn't matter until I'm, I'm done with the piece. So that's kind of what I have to say about that. Um, I hope that helps. <laughs> I know it's not the most straightforward answer. Well, I think a lot of, that, a lot of the times with the, the brushes and things, you have to find stuff that connects with you, right? You have to find, mm -hmm. you have to kind of experiment and just play with them and get used to Photoshop and get used to just you know what brush works for the way you kind of like move your hand and or like yeah. doing master studies and try and be like how do i get a brush that does this particular thing and i think there's sort of there's all those go-to brushes online in terms of you know you can go on like the one pixel brush site and download the jamie jones brushes and and Absolutely. you know all like i mean everyone pretty much just uses all of those <laughs> those yeah. kind of brushes um they're not they're not really too secret or anything really i don't think um and it's just a matter of getting comfortable with them right and yeah, sort of absolutely. trying to work I mean, out what, what i think connects. uh when i was a student i downloaded on mass like you know 800 brushes <laughs> yeah. and yeah i would spend all day trying to find which one i wanted to use and switch between them and it ended up just taking too much time and uh what i ended up doing is uh i i organized them and deleted like 99 percent of them and most of the time I would say I use like 10 to 12 different brushes uh, for each piece and usually no more than that. Occasionally I'll, I'll dig into a different set to find something that I remember. Um, but in the end, I, I feel brush, brush is honestly irrelevant at a certain stage because, I mean, this is just my opinion. I'm not, I'm not really an illustrator. I'm, I'm, my prime focus in, in everything is to, to make a good design. And for me, brush strokes have become less relevant over the years, I guess. You know, I used to make a lot of paintings and try to be really painterly with it. Um, and these days, more of what I try to do is make something that's intriguing in terms of design rather than being something, being more painterly. And I love painterly stuff. It's not like I have a problem with, with being painterly or a problem with people who do that. I mean, I really love it. Um, but it's more that what interests me right now is, is having a good design. And to that extent, I don't think, uh, you know, painterly, I don't think brushes matter too much. It's more about what can you do to convey the information you're trying to get out there and what is going to be the most efficient way of conveying that. So that's, you know, the question I ask myself most of the time is like, what's the best way to do this? How can I do it quickly? Because at the end of the day, I'm just, I'm trying to put down as many ideas as I can, not finish and polish one thing, but I'd rather do 
20 different ideas, you know, of, of interesting things and have them a little bit more infinite than one, like really, really high polished thing. Now that's just my personal preference though. Mm -hmm. So, um, in terms of, you know, brush stuff, I don't pay attention too much to it. I would say most of the time you'll see me using a round brush for like 90% of my stuff. And then, uh, it's really only when I, I want to get very textural that I'll, I'll whip out the other stuff. Yeah, that's cool. And, and do you feel that that's part of like, um, working in the industry that you're that you're specifically in is that it, it's more do you find your job roles are more like idea generation you know like absolutely uh, yeah 100 percent. i mean i i kind of marketed myself to be like that because that's what i enjoy the most mm -hmm. um sorry uh but uh that's almost exclusively what i get hired for these days but you know it's what i love it's what i love to do so it worked out in my case um, I, I would say normally I will get bored of an image if I work on it for like more than a week. And, um, for a lot of people that'd be like, uh, you know, a normal period of time to work on something. But, uh, I find that I'll start having ideas that I really want to explore and those will start dragging me down and I need to get them out somehow. Um, so that's kind of what I built my career so far around is, is being someone who, can generate ideas that you haven't seen before or can generate ideas very quickly. And in the end, that's really what I, what I love to do. It's, it's my favorite part about concept art is making stuff that's unique and interesting that, you know, you haven't seen before that inspires, you know, a feeling of, of awe or inspires an emotion that you felt, you know, one day walking through a street and seeing something that was incredible. Um, so that's kind of what I, what I try to capture a lot of the time. And a lot of times I, I fail at it. But the times that I succeed in it, I'm very happy. That's cool. Um, yeah, we get a bunch more questions here. So uh, I'm studying animals and anatomy at the moment, and was wondering how do you capture the likeness of subject in a drawing? Do you just brute force it and draw the same image multiple times until your drawing resembles the reference? How then do you understand the three D forms without just replicating the two D image? Yeah, really good question. So I'll be upfront and honest. I don't have much experience <laughs> at all with animals. You know, I've done some creatures, but I'm definitely not, you know, the most experienced person when it comes to that. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Like I, I would say from my experience, gesture is the most important thing when it comes to truly capturing the essence of a living creature. Um, is is really trying to find uh, trying trying to train yourself to capture the gesture and I would say uh, doing very quick studies like starting at you know 10 seconds to a minute to five minutes um, and just repeatedly doing that so that you can simplify it and simplify the form understand the anatomy bone structure I think those are all things that really uh, will create a better design and a better You'll be able to capture life in a better way if you if you do that. I don't know if you would if you would agree. You probably have more experience with uh, you know creature stuff than I do. Yeah, I think that I think it just comes down to that you know basic. Uh, <laughs> we've actually been myself and Tim have been teaching students how to draw horses at the moment in class. Awesome. <laughs> and, and it's like horses are hard, but you know it, it comes down to like you know learning those basic shapes to draw the basic shapes first and then kind of learning a bit of the anatomy so you can then yeah. like construct that and then there we go, yeah. and then it's like learning how to draw that in perspective that's like another really difficult thing as well where like you know you have to you have to kind of it, it's like a long it's a long process to get comfortable and then and then a lot of it is then repetition of learning that subject. So, which kind yeah, of goes back to what you're saying, Finn. It's like, if you don't do it all the time, you're not as comfortable sort of sort of doing it. So, uh, I think that, and, and which goes back to, to a lot earlier where you're talking about, you know, drawing is painting, painting is drawing kind of thing, that, that kind of stuff. Just the more you do any of, any of, any of that kind of work, the, the easier those things will become, right? Because you yeah, just get absolutely. more comfortable with actually just drawing something. So, yes. And then, and then getting better at drawing animals and stuff is just that mileage. And then you look at like, you know, Jonathan Koo's stuff, you know, and, oh, and, so, and so you know, like he just busts them out so fast. But yeah. it's just that mileage and understanding those. He just really understands those basic shapes, 
really well yeah. and i think once you do that then you can start getting the likeness in there and yeah you know getting in the gesture and all that kind of stuff but um cool. but yeah it's, it's a good question um yeah i um, think i think you'd be more qualified to answer that than me <laughs> <laughs> oh, i'm not an animal drawer but yeah got plenty of students that we teach you know just how to draw basic basic stuff and it all it all just builds up from there um there's a few people asking when you're coming to australia finn <laughs> oh i'd love to man i'd love to so we'll have to get that to happen hey oh that'd be great you know i'm down anytime anytime that'd be that'd be uh i, I would love to man i've always <laughs> wanted to go so uh um jeremy love asks are there any tips on time management and avoiding plastic uh, procrastination jeremy you don't yes. have any problems with this <laughs> does he are you joking <laughs> uh, jeremy's like uh he's a pro he's he's uh he's been in, in the industry for a long time so oh wow yeah. okay sorry about that <laughs> <laughs> no but, uh, but for, yeah, for so, the, yeah for everyone else like yeah for everybody else yeah so um you know recently uh i've had a lot of projects i've been managing and um i would say the best thing for me, I mean, I've never really been too much of a procrastinator. Uh, so I, I'm speaking at this from, from that point of view, but I understand procrastination. Um, I just, I just block things out in my head. I think about, okay, how long will it take me to do this? I'm, I've been someone that always plans for everything. You know, it's just, it's in my genes. My parents are both, like, you know, obsessive planners and <laughs> uh, yeah, it's crazy. And uh, basically I think, um, how long is it going to take me to complete tasks one, two, three, four, five throughout the day? I structure them uh, in terms of what is the most important. You know, if I have a deadline at a certain time, then I make sure that I do that one first and by, by that period of time. Um, I make sure that I have a plan for, for anything. You know, I, I try to always be, be prepared for the worst outcome. So you know, if, if something happens like a computer crash or something like that, or, or even worse, you know, other situations, I always try to have a plan in place or an idea in place that can help me with that if something does happen. Um, so I would say just try to, um, you know, so I, I've heard that writing things down on a sheet can really help you, you know, that could be good too. Uh, planning your day out on a sheet, but the important part is sticking to it. Like I'm, I'm a really big fan of routines and habits. Like most of my life, I, I, I would say I'm not exactly uh, too much of a spontaneous person. Um, most of the things I do are, are broken down into habits, you know, like things that I repeat daily that over time become very powerful because I do repeat them every day. So I would say trying to form those habits because then you'll become like addicted to them. Like you'll, you'll have to do something by a certain time or your day's going to feel off. That's something that, that helped me a lot when I was uh, struggling with time management. So I hope those kind of help. Um, and That's I would say, advice. you know, rely on your friends too. You know, I've, I have a great group of, of friends in LA who, who helped me with all sorts of stuff. There's times where uh, I've just been out of my depth. Like there's just too much stuff going on and I'll, I'll call one of them for some help. And in, in return, you know, I, I would be always prepared to assist them with stuff. So I would say, you know, if you have a, a good support network of people that you can rely on, that would also be really helpful and really awesome. Yeah, that's good. That's great. So I'm writing back to people. <laughs> okay. Jeremy says, awesome answers. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Jeremy. Um, Pay says, um, where do you find your inspiration besides traveling? Um, question mark. Uh, music, movies, conversations, or relationships? Question mark. All that stuff. All that stuff. So, uh, in terms of, I would say the thing that gives me the most bang for my buck over the years, um, I search and download reference for about 30 minutes every single day. Uh, and my main source, and, you know, I know a lot of people are probably going to give me crap about this, is, is Reddit. <laughs> you know, there's, there's tons of amazing resources and, and subreddits out there for photography, for architecture, for explosions, for culture, for religion, you know, for just every, every single thing from all walks of life. And um, that's something that, you know, I'll gather, like just today I gathered probably like 40 images of stuff. And I have a huge reference library that's probably over a terabyte now, all categorized and organized into tons of different folders. 
And, uh, you know, whenever I start a project, I instantly pull from those. So I can show the, the reference folder I gathered for this. And this is just something I threw together, you know, maybe like five hours ago, you know, as I started working on this. Um, some of these are photos I took myself. So like these ones here, this one, two, three, four, five, these are from various museums I've been to. And, uh, you know, I, I take a lot of photography. I don't post any of it because it's not really meant to be, you know, a, sometimes they're compositions, but they're not meant to be like showpieces. They're more meant to inspire things that I work on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of time what I take photos of is things that are textural, lighting, information, color, stories that I see happening. Uh, and I saved those all. So, you know, a lot of these are from Reddit, from family members, you know, from things that I think are really interesting and can contribute to this image. So these are all things that inspire me, you know, like a bug, like, man, look at the pattern on this. That's incredible. I'm probably going to use that at some point in this image. Um, so I really, I really do get inspired by all sorts of things. And um, I would say, you know, advice in re that regard is, try to find something interesting in everything. You know, I, I truly think that people are capable of finding something interesting in everything. You know, like I, I could be interested in plumbing and, and pipage and sewers. Uh, I could be interested in, you know, even politics, even though I, I dislike politics, I'm very interested in it. I'm interested in it because it has a way of changing society with which influences the world and influences everybody's lives you know all these things are, are big inspirations to me and i try to take every single opportunity i can to learn more about the world and how things work and i think that has has been something that has really really helped me in many ways over the course of my life you know the more you know the better you will be as a designer the more you understand the the better you will be as a problem solver you'll be able to relate to problems more you'll be able to understand people more communicate better um you'll be able to do all sorts of things and it's you need to have that curiosity and if you don't have a curiosity you have to invent it yourself you have to try to find a way to bring it into your life and um i guess that would be my recommendation in terms of that sort of stuff yeah, I think the, the curiosity part's really interesting, right? It, it's like, I feel that sometimes, like, people starting out, it's kind of like, why aren't you into that? <laughs> I don't know why you're not, you know? And yeah. um, I think that's one of the things that's kind of hard to teach, right? It's kind of hard to push people into the, the actually being interested enough in things to really research and find out. You yeah, know, they have to themselves, right? It's yeah. It's like, you have to come to a realization at some point in your life, like, okay, you know, I, I have to find a way to make, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to say it because I've, I've been, most of the things I mentioned, I'm naturally interested in by default, but mm -hmm. I think if you're not, you have to, you have to find a way. And I think that comes from more of a self-realization than anything. You have to really ask yourself, you know, do I want to do this as a career? And if so, then I have to find a way to, you know, make myself better or stronger or more equipped. And that has to do with research and information and learning um, and, and being in love with the process of learning. Um, you know, even if something is scary for me, which a lot of times things are, I, I love the, the process of finding out something new and just, just trying to experiment with my everyday life to make every day a little bit different. Um, sorry, going off on a tangent there. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. So it's so good, so good. Um, yeah, we got heaps of other questions. Uh, what type of what type of projects would you say gain most attention if you were trying to market yourself for the ideas rather than just technical skill? Yeah, I would say projects that involve heavy world building. So you know, I think that projects where um, I think this happens a lot in in game projects. In film, it happens a lot too, but in a very specific stage in pre production. But in games, you know, there could be years and years of pre-production. And I think being the person that they assign, you know, all the building callouts, all the the blue sky exploration, you know, that's like a lot of what I do these days is blue sky exploration, being able to show the director and production designer a ton of different ideas for how something could look rapidly. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, you don't have to wait for a project to come along that'll make you do that. Uh, you know, I invented them myself. I would, 
all my projects for school are, are just like that. You know, they're, you know, Blue Valley, when I first started it with my friends, um, 90% of it were 30 minute paintings, you know, like, I think we did something like 40 paintings uh, that were just world building paintings to explore the relationships of design and architecture and characters to the world around them. And that's not something that you ever need to, you know, wait for some project to come along where you can do that. I would just start doing it now because, you know, you don't want to be hired for something that you don't want to do. So if you're if you're the person in a game project that's being taxed with doing like sky boxes or or just props or something like that, and you don't want to be that person, you know, it's okay if you do. There's a lot of people that love that. You know, I love doing props. Um, but if that's not what you want your career to be, then it's up to you to do that in your own time to show potential employers that you can do that for them. And before you know it, if you do a successful project, you'll get a job for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that's good. That's good. Um, I notice a lot of artists, including yourself, uh, use Cinema 4D in conjunction with Octane. Yeah. What do you like slash don't like about it? I'm beginning to start integrating investing in 3d for my workflow so it'd be cool to get your thoughts on it oh, i love it i mean there's not much i dislike about it honestly um i think you know any workflow takes a while to get used to but i've been i've been very lucky you know when i was yeah, when i was in high school i i used cinema 4d for like graphic design basically you know that's what i wanted to be before i wanted to be a concept artist so i learned about all the different functions it has and what I love about it is that um, it enables you to be very efficient in your workflow. You know, it has so many different tools and modifiers and ways to make you faster in designing, you know, the, just the sheer power of instancing, which is where uh, if you have a, a complex 3d object, you can duplicate it without taking up excess Ram or video Ram in your computer. You know, that's something I use daily. You know, if I have to do an army of people, of like literally thousands of people, that is something I can now simulate in 3D with cinema. You know, I can do liquid simulations, I can do cloth simulations, I can do explosions, fog, mist, all that sort of stuff that with a lot of other programs, you'd need a bunch of stuff together to do it in conjunction. So that's one of the reasons I really love it. Um, it, it like I said, you know, it does take a while to learn, but the great thing about Cinema 4D with Octane that a lot of the other plugins don't actually have is that uh, Cinema 4D runs like natively with Octane. I'm not sure that's the best word to describe it, but mm -hmm. you basically convert your Cinema 4D scene to an Octane scene without having to change anything. So I could work, like I don't, I don't have to pick up the Octane workflow to use Cinema with Octane. I can just use the Cinema workflow yeah. and it just renders it all with all of Octane stuff. And not only that, but all of the, the great things about cinema, like for me, cinema has one of the best uh, catalogs of noise in the world and noise meaning like different pattern generations. Um, like for example, uh, creating, creating a, if you want to simulate something like cloth or you want to simulate a fog or a sky or something like that, um, Cinema 4D has like endless variations of different types of noise to simulate those things realistically. And that's something that, you know, natively Octane has some, but not nearly as in depth as cinema does. And with the plugin, you can use all of those extra cinema features with Octane, which is something that I really, really dig about it. Mm -hmm. So I hope that kind of answers their question. No, that's cool. Um, what else we got here? You kind of touched on this one a little bit before, but how, how do you will yourself to continue working on a single piece for sustained periods of time? I find it difficult to work on something for more than a day or so. Should I be? Okay, content? so a day is pretty short. Yeah, you're going to need to find something to help yourself out. Because <laughs> uh, it's almost, you know, there's, there's a lot of times where I'll do, you know, if I'm doing sketches, I wouldn't have to do any revisions. But if you're doing like really important key moments, there's almost always going to be something you have to change. Um, you know, part of it for me is, uh, you know, if you work a day on an image, there's always going to be things that you can do to make it better. You're never going to be like finished with a piece unless, you know, you're being very sketchy with it in one day. So how, a lot of the times, you know, for me, 
I do want my artistry and rendering and stuff to be of a good quality. You know, I'm not going to render something to death, but I do want to feel like it's represented in a really clear, understandable, beautiful way. Um, so what I tell myself in those instances is like, okay, what if I had five more minutes to, to make this better? What would the thing? What would be the thing that I do to improve this image? And I, I keep repeating that to myself. Okay, I have five minutes. I have five minutes. What What is the thing I can do to have the most impact on this image? Um, and then you know, if if all else fails and you're working on something for a month, which happens, you know, just say you know it's a job. You know, we're extremely lucky. If you're a concert artist. I mean, I, I consider myself incredibly lucky. I consider any concert artist incredibly lucky because we get to paint for a living and make like a good living out of it. And, um, you know, there's going to be moments there, they might be few or they might be many where it will be a job. Um, for me, most of my work does not feel like a job. It, it feels like I'm painting my own stuff. But there are moments like if I had to work on a piece for a month, where, you know, I, I just have to remind myself, you know, you're really lucky to be in this position. Uh, even though you worked hard, this is very rare that you get to enjoy, you know, this sort of career. And, um, you know, you just like suck it up is what I would say. Like, <laughs> it's people are, you're, you're at your client's disposal. You're, they're paying you for an important service. And it's very, very important to not have an ego and to, well, you can enjoy your projects, but also distance yourself from the professional projects you have because they're, they aren't owned by you. Um, and don't, don't ever have an ego about it because they aren't your property. And uh, if someone asks you to change something because they're paying you for it, you better darn change it. So I hope that <laughs> is a good answer to that. Yeah, and because I'm, I'm not sure whether it's a student or a, or a professional artist, yeah. I'm not asking the question, but I think, um, you know, if you're working on some projects where it's a bit of a grind or whatever, then then do some personal pieces as well. You know, do some yeah. stuff when you get home, or do some you know do some things that are different, that are interesting, just to keep it fresh. Like I always think it's good to have like a couple of things on, you know, at the same time, so you just you you really inspired about it. You know, you don't yeah. lose that that passion for something. Absolutely. And then also, if you're a student, sometimes sometimes that fr frustration can just come from your your level of skill. At the, at the current time you know like you work on something for a while and you're just like i don't know how to make this i literally don't know how to make this any better like it goes above your kind of pay grade so with with that problem then it's just a matter of like building and developing your skills and i think finn will probably agree go back to those fundamentals really learn that those components and then that'll yeah. help you push your paintings your drawings to that like next level um, yeah. but it's definitely 100%. a process <laughs> yeah it's not over day. It's not, not day and night, you know. I was just looking back to my paintings from seven years ago when I was, um, you know, just starting out in school. And, man, you know, they're ugly. But <laughs> the important thing is that I asked tons of people for advice. And I think that's really important when you're a student is, you know, just like I said, don't have an ego. But ask everybody what you can improve on. I mean, I asked every single – every time I did a new piece, I asked every single person in my term. Um, you know, no matter what style they had, no matter what background they had, you know, I asked them, what do you think I could do to make this better? And through that, I, I gained a lot. I think I learned a lot. And um, I definitely recommend that if you're a student too, is like get as much feedback as you can because it will help you. And it'll go a long way. And that's really interesting. So how did, do you find that because you did that a lot, you got over the whole because it's hard to do that, right? Like sometimes it's very like you, you don't want someone to say something bad about it. So it can be tricky. Do you find that you just did a lot? So then that broke the whole mental thing. I mean, this is thankfully the teachers I had and, you know, I, I don't think I've ever been a person that has been super attached to like hearing others opinions about stuff. Like I'm fine if someone doesn't like something that I make. But my teachers, especially early on, like even before I went to Art Center, I took a summer intensive course with some great friends of mine now, Thomas and Scott Centeno. And they, they really drilled home the idea that, you know, you, you can't be offended by anything that, that people throw at you. You can't be offended. You shouldn't be offended. It's not personal. You know, someone giving you critique on your art is not attacking you. Um, it's it's someone trying to help you improve and, and you've got to use that to, to get better. And it's a resource. If anything, it's a resource to me, being able to ask those people for advice. I mean, I really valued their opinions. I valued the time they were spending 
could give me advice to help me move forward and to help me be a better designer. And, you know, sometimes that advice, like the one thing you run into is like, what if their advice is wrong? You know, what if they get feedback? But it turns out no advice is wrong. The re there, there's a reason they're giving you that advice. If they see something that they're disagreeing with, um, you know, it could be about what they learned. It could be about their background, but it doesn't make their opinion wrong. You know, you can choose to ignore it or you can choose to understand the, the perspective that they are coming from to better understand how you can improve your piece. Yeah, that's cool. That's some, that's some yeah, good advice. I like it. <laughs> um, we've got a, got a questions, a couple of questions are kind of similar. Um, what you, what's your made motivation to keep working in this challenging industry? I think you kind of answered some of that stuff before, but, and then, and then also, okay, I can take a stab at that. Yeah, and and then also, how do you manage? Um, <laughs> this is, how do you manage time to do all of this work? I asked Simon this yesterday, and he has an amazing wife to look out for all that sort of stuff. But at your age, finances, relationships, paying those bills is not just planning and organizing. Who is out there? Who is out there looking out for you in in your day to day life? That's a long question. <laughs> That's okay. So you know, I'll start with the first one in terms of motivation. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is kind of a cop out, but I don't really require motivation because there's just too much stuff I want to make. Like I want to be done with something so I can move on to the next thing. There's too many things I want to create, too many stories I want to tell. And every time I get into, like I have, I have at least 20 folders in this Blue Valley project of different places that I, I need to design that I've already thought of that I want to make. And I love it. You know, like, this I wouldn't ask for anything else. This is the best life I could ask for is one where I'm creating this sort of stuff. Like mm -hmm. it's, you know, when I was growing up, I was inspired by science fiction movies, video games. You know, I'm a huge gamer. Um, and being able to contribute to this stuff, it really just, it's, it makes me feel so happy. It makes me feel alive. And being able to make something that has all these ideas that's a part of me, a part of my experiences that I've contributed to. I don't, I don't feel like I need motivation to do that. I, if anything, I need motivation to go to bed at night because I want to stay up and make more stuff. Um, I would say if I could give advice to people who are trying to find motivation, it's, I, I think it's again, like find that pas passion or interest that you have, you know, try to find something out there that you really, really want to represent or care about. Um, find some way, you know, it could be that, I mean, it could be something like a job you want to get one day. Like, you know, at the beginning of my career, it was, you know, all about working for X studio, working on X project. And when I, when I finished those and I, when I worked on all the stuff I wanted to work on, there was a moment where I paused and I was like, okay, well, now what do I do? You know, I've, I've done all the stuff I wanted to career wise that I wanted to do. And I, I kind of reassessed and made a list of, of goals that I now am hitting. And, um, you know, some of those are personal that are completely unrelated to work. Some of them are related to work. They're like things that I want to achieve in the next couple of years. And I think having like some sort of list where you put down your thoughts of, of things you want to do, places you want to go, where you see yourself in five years, that can all help and try to work back from there. So like, say if someone wants to be an art director or like a creative director, or they want to work at a studio, you know, work back from that. What can you do right now to ensure that that is your guaranteed outcome? And let that be your inspiration moving forward for all your decisions you make. Um, so that answers that question. For the other question, um, sorry, remind me again what the other question was. The other question was, um, sorry, let me just get back to that. Um, just kind of like, how do you manage your time to do all of this work? Mm. Um, I know I was talking to this ah, person yeah. the other day and, and, and kind of like, you know, I've got a big family and stuff. So they were like, how do you fit all of this in? Um, yeah. So it's kind of that, yeah, that question to you. Uh, so over, uh, over a, a long period of time, the best thing I found is to optimize your workflow as much as you can to complete as much as you can as fast, you know? Like uh, using medium, using cinema, painting, all this stuff are, are different tools to help you with your final product. And they, 
I, I try to aim them on based around efficiency. You know, how fast can I represent an idea? What that does is it lets me complete my jobs a lot faster. Um, you know, like I said, I've always been someone who plans a lot. I don't really need too much help organizing stuff. Um, I, I always, I, I would just recommend planning, you know, try to find a way in your life to look at all the things that take up your time and try to optimize them. And, you know, I, I'm not recommending be a workaholic because, you know, I love work, <laughs> but I also have a clear separation. Like I get eight to 10 hours of sleep. I play video games. I go on hikes. I work out all this stuff. You know, you can have a really balanced, healthy lifestyle. Um, but you never want to take on so much stuff that it, takes away your sleep or, or the rest of the things that you enjoy because you're, you're quickly going to spiral out. And that did happen to me once like four years ago. And uh, you get yourself kind of caught in the hole. Uh, and ever since that moment, I've always been very conscious about planning my hours and time for, for pretty much everything. Um, so I just say, you know, get used to planning, get used to having a schedule, sticking to it. Um, you know, I, like I said, I have a big support network of, of very great friends that I rely on. I give them work. They bring me work. Uh, we all help each other out as much as possible. And we all give each other critique on images and talk about all sorts of things in our lives that, that I think that's really, really helpful for me is having a group of people that you can always rely on. Um, that's helped me a lot. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. It's good. I guess I'll do one last question before we go. Since, since, uh, unfortunately, the time is already up. Yeah, running out of time. Quick. Running out yeah. of time. Um, I think I think we might have covered all of those questions. Does anyone have any last question they want to ask last really questions. quick? <laughs> hey, I got a question. While you while um while yeah. we're doing that is um so one thing i find we kind of like you know reference and stuff is that yeah i'm because i'm the same you know like terabytes and terabytes of folders and things but i actually find a lot of time i just i just end up researching everything on google right as you're doing yeah. something like how do you how do you kind of manage that are you someone that really tries to stick to your folders and your reference library that you're kind of creating uh, oh, or you I just always, like google i always stuff look up or? stuff on google but say for this project i probably have something like I, I'm very, very organized with my references. So let's, uh, I can, I can say, let, let me just show you, I can go into it. Uh, so this is at the top here are all things that I need to organize right now. So these are stuff I collected today. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I have a split into all these different sections, you know, so animals, interesting objects, architecture. If I go to architecture, I have by country and city. So these are all different cities. Uh, some I've been to, uh, right. some are things that I've collected on. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I need something from one of these places, I can just click it there. But I also have things broken down, you know, into individual different things like material inspirations, military, futuristic, rubble, organic. You know, I try to be as detailed as I can. And then also whenever I start a new project like Blue Valley, for instance, the Blue Valley has its own master reference file with another, you know, 10 different folders, mm -hmm. probably with like 500, 600 images in there. And what that helps me do is that whenever I start a new piece or new project, I instantly remember, oh, hey, I have all these references I planned for months ago. And I go to that folder and I just grab all of them and use them. So, you know, for the images that I used to inspire this, I didn't grab, I maybe grabbed a couple of them today, but they weren't directly related to this project. Um, they were all things that I had gathered in the past and plan to use in the future. So I'll always, when I'm starting a new project, I always use Google, but for me, it's really, really helpful to already have a lot of that already uh, taken care of beforehand. Yeah, that's cool. That's good. Um, okay. Last question. Uh, I really yeah. want to get better at thumbnail drawings. What size drawing brush thought process, etc., do you use? I watch really cool artists blocking shapes with a big brush and tone, but I lean more towards using line. Yeah, line is great. Um, I was, when I started doing thumbnails, I was someone who also preferred uh, shapes. So I did a lot of like blocky shapes. I almost never did line work. Uh, was the question is so like how to become a better uh, thumbnail the, artist? Yeah, how to just kind of get better at doing thumbnails. Yeah, so I, I would say whenever you're doing a thumbnail, uh, the most important thing for me is have this navigator open. And what that does is it compresses your image to be a very, very small read. 
And you want to always be looking at the black and white values of something from far away. And you want to be able to say, okay, at this, for, for this being this far away, uh, am I able to understand what this image is about in three seconds? And that's like a good rule. Um, the sign that they taught in our school is like, okay, if you zoom out from the thumbnail, can you understand what's happening? Can you understand where the foreground, middle ground, background are? And um, that's how I used to judge my, my work. And I still do that a lot of the time, but especially when you're learning the thumbnail, zooming out, looking at something from very far away and trying to understand the read really helps. Um, and then going back to the marker drawings, uh, I think that's also something that helped me a lot with thumbnails, like small marker drawings, doing them time to like five minutes. Um, because what it does is it makes you focus on conveying information in the most efficient way possible. Because any stray line um, can actually mess up the whole composition. It'll affect the way you perceive it. And uh, I would say that never put a stroke down for just no reason. You should have a reason, an idea for every single stroke you make. You shouldn't put down a stroke just because you're thinking it might look good there. You should always be thinking, oh, I'm gonna use this stroke to accentuate this. I'm gonna use this stroke to make the lighting better and have a, a thought process behind it. And after a long time, it'll become natural. Um, but you know, that's, that's what I'd recommend, just having a reason for everything. No, that's great, that's great. So, um... Yeah, well, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up there. So yeah, I'm sorry I can't stay longer, man. It's been really fun. No, it's all it's all good, and I'm sure everyone appreciates you, you know, joining the stream and, and checking it out. Um, there's lots of people saying they'd like to see a VR workshop. So uh, yeah, we oh, that'd be great. To, yeah, we might have to might have to try and organize that. But um, oh, I'd love to, man. Absolutely, I would yeah. have a fantastic time. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, very cool. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for everyone checking out the stream. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be back next week. Same. Thank you guys. Same time, same place. Thanks, Finn. See you guys.